that we've done. Hope you've been singing along at home. At uh, this time, we're going to sing Great is Thy Faithfulness. Again, sing along if you like, or just sit there and enjoy it. Welcome back to church tonight. Wasn't that a good message this morning? Uh, praising God for the opportunity that we still have to hear the preaching of God's Word. And I'm um, looking forward to what God has in store for us again tonight. Thank you again for joining us um, uh, all throughout the week. Last Sunday, tons of views and, and last Wednesday night as well. And uh, of course this morning. Uh, keep tuning in to our RHBC Facebook page and YouTube page for good content and then when you see that content like share it uh, Comment on it and let's make sure that more people are able to see uh, What's going on here at Rochester Hills Baptist Church again? We're thankful to have you tonight um, Joining around the Word of God even though we're not together of course uh, But able to, to join one another in fellowship and I know that many of you are commenting even right now um, on our page. Do that throughout the service. And then stick around after church tonight, about 10 minutes after. All right, about 10 minutes after, join uh, the Facebook Live. I'll be putting on from my office, but just kind of hanging out in the church lobby and fellowshipping a little while, maybe talking about the day and just encouraging one another, challenging one another 
um, for about 10 minutes and we'll have a word of prayer right after the service tonight on Facebook Live as well. But again, thanks for joining us tonight. Let's pray and I ask God to bless our service. Dear Holy Father, Lord God, again, we're thankful for the opportunity to hear your word preached, and we're thankful for Brother Hal. We're thankful for all of these people that we miss so much. I pray that you would bless them and encourage them and keep them safe. Um, we're praying the blood of Jesus will protect us, uh, protect our people physically, financially, protect the relationships. Lord, I pray that it would be a, this would be a profitable time for you. Challenge us again tonight in the service tonight. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Enjoy the rest of the service. Jesus, sweet rose of Sharon, spotless and pure Lamb of God. Jesus, Lion of Judah, promise Emmanuel, God's Son. Jesus, my Lord and Creator, who witnessed and conquered the grave. Jesus, the world's only Savior. Jesus, what a wonderful name. Some call it progress and we must conform, or we will be left by the chair. Religion serves the God of their choice, but salvation still comes in one name. That name is Jesus, sweet rose of Sharon, spotless and pure Lamb of God. Jesus, Lion of Judah, promised Emmanuel, God's Son. Jesus, my Lord and Creator, who witnessed and conquered. Savior, Jesus, what a wonderful name. All the great leaders who sleep in their graves, one day will bow down and proclaim. He's Lord of all glory, he's the crown king of kings. All creation will thunder his name, his glorious name. Good evening and welcome to the evening service of Rochester Hills Baptist Church. I'm glad that you're uh, listening in. I hope that you were able to uh, tune in this morning for our service. hope that the day has been a blessing to you. Uh, before I get started, I want you to notice that behind me, the screens are not on. Last Sunday night, as Acts flashed between Acts and Hitachi, and then Wednesday night, as Proverbs flashed between Proverbs and Hitachi, I came to the conclusion that strike three, I'm out. I don't want to be out. So uh, you'll know we're in the book of Acts. Been preaching through the book of Acts on Sunday night. And so I pray that uh, it'll be a help and a blessing to you. Uh, what I want to do this evening is spend a little time showing the importance of doing what's right. The early church, they've had great numbers of people saved. God's blessing has come upon them. They've been through some difficulties from persecution on the outside. And now 
there's some little ripples within, some little problems. And so uh, now they have a decision. What are we going to do? Here's the situation in Acts chapter 6. You had the uh, Jewish Christians and you had the Gentile converts who all were a part of the same church. Well, that's wonderful. That's great. Except there were still some underlying difficulties, some tensions. And in this particular case, the unsay, or I'm sorry, the Gentiles, the, the, the Grecians is what they were called, those who weren't Jewish, the, the Grecians were upset thinking that their widows had been mistreated. Their widows had been neglected. It was a Jewish uh, custom that uh, part of the offerings received in the temple were used to help to take care of the widows. Well, obviously the early church followed that same custom and the money as was able was distribute, distributed to help those that could be helped. Let's read the scripture. Acts chapter 6, verse number 1. The Bible says, And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased. And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of, priests, of the priests were obedient to the faith. There was, uh, in verse number one, we see a problem. But this church faced the problem and took care of it. Let's pray as we begin the message. Lord, I, I, I ask your blessing upon this time. Lord, I thank you for the privilege to preach the word of God. And even though in these times of uh, carefulness, these times when we're uh, concerned about uh, caring one for another, that we still have the freedom to teach and to preach the Word of God. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you'd bless the message tonight. I pray that it would be an encouragement to our church family and also to those who may be listening in. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse number one gives a, a, a cause for rejoicing. The Bible says, In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, the church was growing. Oh, I love it when the church is growing. I love it when people get saved. I love it when we're able to reach more folks through our ministries. Somebody says, well, you're just one of those churches that's only interested in numbers. No, that's not the case at all. But I notice in the Bible that, that Jesus numbered those that came to hear him preach. You see, every number represents a person. Every person represents a soul. And so the fact that, that people were multiplied in this early church is certainly a cause for rejoicing. You see, when people get saved, it pleases God. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 says, God's long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. When a person gets saved, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. That's what Luke chapter 15 tells us. And so when, when a person gets saved, God is pleased. Look, if the Lord's pleased, I don't think 
it would be a bad thing for us to rejoice. Not only uh, is it a demonstration of the pleasure of God, but the fact that people were getting saved is a demonstration of the power of the gospel. Romans 1.16, Paul writes, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is a power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Look, people don't get saved because somebody's a good preacher. People don't get saved because the soul winner has a, wisdom, uh, a winsome personality. People get saved because the Holy Spirit of God convicts their heart and God saves them. We're the messengers, but God saves, and the gospel is still the power of God unto salvation. There was cause for rejoicing because the Lord honored the preaching of his word. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 21 tells us that God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. God's plan has always been the preaching of his word. God's plan has always been the preaching of the gospel. And so they were able to rejoice because God's people were faithful. Verse 42 of the last chapter says, daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. There was faithfulness with their lips and with their lives. Their testimonies were such that people were getting saved. Now, I understand salvation is of the Lord, and I would never take credit for anything uh, but, but uh, along those lines, but I am so thankful that I get to pastor a church where we see people saved. I'm so grateful that I get to pastor a group of people that want to see others saved. And so uh, when we're able, we invite our friends and invite our loved ones and witness to our neighbors and do what we can to present the gospel, whether it be with our lips, with our tracks, through the invitations to come to church, or even in these days, encouraging people to listen online. And so they rejoiced that people were getting saved, but there were some complaints. You know, I guess if you have people, eventually you're going to have problems. Now, I'm very grateful that, that uh, our church, Rochester Hills Baptist Church, there's a wonderful spirit of unity. And there's not the, the pettiness and the picking one at another that oftentimes uh, is, is evident in a church. I'm thankful that God has kept us from that. But we, we need to be diligent. We need to be careful. Uh, what happened here, these folks, the Bible says there arose, well, I'm in verse 1, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. You see, they were complaining that the Jewish women were preferred. They were getting preferential treatment, and maybe the Greeks were being, the Gentiles were being ignored on purpose. Maybe it was a deliberate slight, a deliberate snub. And so uh, a murmuring began. And by the way, that's always bad, always bad, because Every church problem, I'm convinced, begins with a murmuring, begins with criticism, begins with, with an attitude that, that is contrary to what God intends for his people. Did you know that it's a sin to complain? Did you know that it's a sin to murmur? The Bible says, let all things be done without murmuring and complaining. And so every time I complain, every time I murmur, every time I express my displeasure, it displeases God. It disobeys God. God has told us not to do it. And if we do it, we are guilty of disobeying God. You know, I, I think if a person lies, they're aware that they're telling a lie. I think if a person uh, uses a curse word, they're aware that they're cursing. But I'm convinced most people complain without even giving it a thought. They say things like, well, I'm not really complaining. I'm just stating a fact. 
Well, complaining is the absence of gratitude. God said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. 1 Thessalonians 5 commands us, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I can't complain and give thanks at the same time. It's impossible to complain and rejoice at the same time. You see, our complaining is often directed at God. We, we, we're not satisfied. We don't like what God is doing. We, we even wonder if he's in control. You see, the problem with complaining, another problem, there are many, but another problem is cl- complaining never happens alone. There always has to be a sympathetic ear. There always has to be somebody to listen to. If you notice, it's just no fun to gripe if nobody's listening. It doesn't do any good. You, you have to find somebody to listen to. And so consequently, you, when you complain, it causes a division. That's what happened here. The Gentile Christians and the Hebrew Christians, there's a, there's a, a murmuring going on that could have led to an outright feud or even a, a split in the church. So rather than address the problem, they were griping about it. They were complaining about it. When I complain, when you complain, it keeps me from being grateful and it diminishes my ability to appreciate what God has done for me. And so uh, they began to complain. They began to gripe. They began to murmur. Action had to be taken. What are we going to do? Well, let's look at verse 3. Well, let's start, in fact, verse 2. Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, It's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Essentially, they're saying, We don't have time to take care of all these widows. We don't have time to make sure that everybody is provided for. Verse 3, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. We'll give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And so there, was, there, there were some obvious uh, areas that needed attention. The widows needed to be cared for. They, they uh, depended upon these offerings. They depended upon this support. They depended upon this help. They obviously needed to be cared for, but the Word of God still needed to be preached. That's the Great Commission. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And, and, and these, these who did preach, they needed time to pray. They needed time to study They needed time to prepare the messages. And so uh, there's a a, a dilemma. What are we going to do? How are we going to preach if we don't pray and study? If we don't pray and study, we won't be able to preach. But if we're doing these, we don't have time to care for the widow ladies. How do we fix this? Well, the solution is fairly simple. They just enlisted others to ease the burden. They got other people to help out. You see, not not everybody could teach and preach. Not everybody was an apostle. Not everybody was called to preach. We have several men in our church who are very, very capable preachers. We have fellows on staff. We have godly laymen who, who... uh, are, are capable and qualified, but certainly not everybody can preach. Not everybody could do the work of the apostles. And so they said, we, we need to find some guys that can be a help. Now, there were requirements on this. They wanted guys that had a good testimony. They, they said, look out... Uh, Look out among you, uh, seven men of honest report. That is, they they were men of integrity, 
People who knew them trusted them. People who, who were aware of them had confidence in them. Said so we need some guys of, of good testimony. Also, he said, full of the Holy Ghost. We want spiritual men. We want godly men. We want these folks that are, that are helping to have a, a good testimony. We want them to be spiritual and love the Lord. And then the last part of uh, verse number three, it says, uh, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. We need some guys with common sense. We need fellows with the discernment to make the decisions they need to make. And so uh, find some qualified, find some godly, find some men who meet these conditions, that they have a good testimony, that they, they are spiritual, full of the Holy Ghost, and they, they're wise people, uh, guys with, with wisdom, sensibility about them. And so they, they chose seven men. That's interesting. Most Bible scholars, and I don't differ with this at all, uh, say that these men who were chosen were deacons. It's interesting in Acts chapter 6, they're not called deacons. They're just seven men who were chosen to help. Uh, we have requirements given in two different places in the New Testament for deacons, but there's no indication really other than the fact that they help to take care of the widows and they help to ease the burden of the apostles, that these were indeed deacons. I'm not saying they weren't. I'm just saying it's interesting to me that in this particular case, they're not called deacons, but they were chosen to be a blessing, to be a help. They were chosen to help lift the burden of the preacher. They were chosen to help alleviate the concern of those who were arguing back and forth about preferential treatment and purposeful uh, ignoring those in need. And, and they, were, they were a help to the widows who uh, were at the bottom of this situation uh, where they had to have their needs met. They had to be taken care of. This was essential. And so they, they chose these people and it was a blessing for everybody. In fact, notice verse 7. It says, And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to faith. Hey, what a wonderful outcome. First of all, the complainers were silenced. Fix the problem. There's nothing to gripe about. The congregation was pleased. Care was given to the widows. And then people kept getting saved. Converts were multiplied. In fact, I think it's wonderful. The Bible tells us that a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. These were the religious folks. These were the ones who, uh, a number of them were opposed to the preaching and opposed to the teaching, but because of the ministry of caring for the widows, because of dealing with the problems, because of settling the issues between the two factions, and because of the ministry of the church, the testimony convinced even those who originally were opposed to Christianity to accept, to believe, to become Christians. So what can we learn from this? What are the responses that you and I can have? Well, first of all, I think we need to be careful not to complain. We need to ask God to give us grateful and thankful spirits. Remember what God has done for you. Yeah, I know times are tough right now. I know our lives are topsy-turvy and we don't know what the future holds, but you just stop and think, what God has done for you. The songwriter said, Through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come. Tis grace, tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. You remember what God has done for you. He's saved you. He's kept you. He's met your needs. He's provided for you. He's answered your prayers. Remember 
what God has done. And then secondly, rejoice in what God has done. Rejoice in what God has done for you. Not just recall, but give thanks. Be excited. Praise the Lord for his goodness to you. And then finally, recognize what God is doing now. Oh, we can look at all of our inconveniences. We can look at our sacrifices. We can look at, at, at situations where we just wonder, how am I going to make it? But think of where you are right now. You're saved. You're in the hand of God. Your needs are met. Your, your uh, uh, prayers are being answered. And we could go on and on and on. But it's, it's important for us to recognize that there's no need to complain. There's no need to murmur. Secondly, we should be careful to do what we can do. What helped the apostles was that they were able to do what they needed to do. They were able to pray. They were able to study. They were able to preach because others did what they were able to do. They were able to distribute to the widows. They were able to calm the murmurings in the church. And so uh, all of us are able to do something. Everybody can get right and stay right. No greater help you can be to your family than to be right with God. No greater blessing you can be to others in this time than to be right with God. A testimony. Everybody can get right with God and stay right. Everybody can pray. Everybody can be an encouragement. Everybody can be a blessing. And so we, we need to be careful to do what we can do. And we need to be cautious that we not let the devil uh, worm his way into our hearts or into our lives, into our homes, into our church. We need to guard against iniquity, that is sin in our lives. We need to guard against inactivity, doing nothing. We can't do everything we want to do. We can't do all that we would like to do, but we can do some things, so let's do them. We need to guard against indifference. That's the idea of not caring. Ah, it doesn't affect me. It doesn't affect my family. No big deal. Shame on us if that's our attitude. This is a time that God's people can truly be light in a dark world. We can truly be the salt of the earth. We need to guard against ingratitude. That selfish, uh, it's all about me concept. And then we need to guard against becoming insensitive toward the desires of God, toward the, the, the problems, the despair of others. We should be consistent in looking for ways to be a blessing, to be a help. Be, be aware. Just, just pay attention. A couple of weeks ago, I know he won't mind me saying this, but uh, we had some special music recorded to use in our, our, one of our broadcasts. And a after the whole session was over, uh, Pastor Brent came out and for somehow he walked by a reflection of himself and he said, why didn't anybody tell me that my tie was crooked? And all of us said, we didn't notice. We didn't look. <laughs> We didn't pay attention. Every time I get prepared to do one of these broadcasts, I say, is my tie straight? I don't want to look like Pastor Brent. Now, it may or may not be straight by, by now, but the point is we have to be aware, be alert. You know, I think we could find ways to be a blessing if we were just searching for ways to be a blessing. I think it would be possible to uh, encourage people if we look for somebody that needed encouragement and be available. Just let people know you're available. So what are we, what's the whole point of this? God's work is worth our sacrifice. The, 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 program of God is worth 
whatever it costs for us to do that. We need to lay aside whatever differences we might have. We need to focus on not what I can do to please myself, but how can I be a blessing? How can I be a help to others? And so we, we need to strive to grow in our, in our walk with God personally and then in our work for God to others. You know, in a time like this, we can be a great blessing. Well, it's easy. We're mandated to stay at home. So we can hibernate. We can pretty much, like a turtle, draw into our shell. Or we can look for ways to encourage, look for ways to be a help, look for ways to be a blessing to others. Heavenly Father, I ask your blessing on the message I pray that it would be a help to each of our church members. I thank you again, God, that our church, as far as I know, there aren't any petty problems. There aren't any divisions. You've given us a wonderful spirit and great unity, but I know the devil would fight that. So in these times, help us to not complain and help us to certainly do all that we can to be a help and a blessing and encouragement to others. God be with our church family, we ask in Jesus' precious name, amen.